I believe it's open. <laughs> we'll see about that. Uh, did you want me to go through these? Or? Um, well, everyone can read pretty effectively. I'll probably stop you on interesting ones and share a bit, because I know we have a, a few new faces here that might not be familiar with every slide, so they don't change that Sure, more. I have no problem controlling um, <laughs> Real quick, I do want to thank everyone for showing up on our final uh, meeting for 2018. I don't remember if it's our sixth year we're finishing or our seventh, um, but Fox Pass has been going for a while. And thank you all for being a part of it. Um, so Board of Directors for the organization as a whole is coming up. And uh, to my understanding, you don't have been a long running member to go there and vote. Um, so if you know some of the candidates or are interested in one of them being on the board of directors, or, yeah. so this, I believe it just finished. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. So I, I thought January was the end date for voting, but yeah, that's actually I think they stuff. closed it early this time. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, so I guess you can't vote, but next year. <laughs> Summit in Seattle um, was just last month. If you did not go and don't know what it is, it's the biggest uh, gathering of SQL professionals in the world. And it's an amazing, almost week-long uh, learning experience where you get to network with some of the best. And I strongly encourage people to go to that if you're not aware. If you can try to make it out next year or convince your business to help pay for it. This is an on. Yeah, I, I also struggle to find exactly what the details of this event truly is. Um, they just basically have a few <coughs> like webinar sessions that you can sign up to attend and then attend from the comfort of your own home or office. Yeah, I think it's just 24 or 48 hours of online classes, like online seminars like this. Some of them are pre recorded, but I think most are in person. I think so. And here are our beginning of our list of virtual groups. There are, um, if you're interested, we'll have a slide with a bunch of them in small thumbnails, but there are literally hundreds of virtual groups out there. Um, I would, yeah, I would, you might want to bookmark that one. It should be pretty good if you're interested in the query store. And Aaron Spilato knows everything there is to know among people who don't work at Microsoft, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a generic list of some of our past groups. There are a lot out there. If you've got downtime at work, there's almost always something out there that's got, if, if nothing else, that's there just to save their old sessions. It's lots of interesting information. No local SQL Saturdays for us. And it, does, it starts back up again with the new year, I would think. If you know somebody who is interested in sponsoring PASS, either any of the local chapters in Wisconsin or at a national level, um, yeah. feel free to reach out to us. Yeah, we're to it. It's been out there. <laughs> uh, anybody in this room not a member of PASS? You don't know who you are now? I would definitely sign up. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So this end of the year kind of winds down. I'll probably uh, I want to say May we'll start seeing dates for some of our other people. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and the upcoming sequel Saturday in Chicago in March. And I believe Matt is at the end of March as well. So, doesn't um, I think the call for speakers for both. Ah, the call for speakers for Chicago is like, I want to say, second week of January is when it ends. So, if that's something you're interested in, you know, don't sleep on that one. And that's pretty easy to sleep on because all the holidays and everything. You're going to come back to work and be like, I've got two days, you know. So, January 8th at midnight. January 8th. And it's, it's a nice one. It's like somewhere to Madison. Paris. Yep. And the location is great. Too. Yeah, it's on the north side. Not, not way down south or anything. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Now.
now let's see if I can open my presentation. <clears throat> Hopefully it saved my edits to make this, oh dear. It did not save my edits. So this unfortunately still looks as though I'm presenting in Minnesota. I forgot to change the title slide. I hope you will all forgive me. Um, I made some edits earlier, but then everything started crashing. So. Um, We'll just go ahead and get started. Thanks to everybody for coming. Um, appreciate you giving up some time here uh, on a Wednesday night. Uh, how long do I really have? Until about five minutes or so. Okay, I'll see what I can do there. <laughs> Until the beer runs out. All right, I'll try to go for about an hour or so and like see where we are. I think that's I think that's pretty solid. Um, so I'm here to talk about locking. I think it's an important thing to understand. I'll talk about why I think that's important in a second. I just want to tell you a little bit about me first, so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, I got a PhD in mathematics in 2010. And you say, well, what are you doing with SQL Server? So I was a faculty member at Texas State University until 2013, but um, it is difficult to make a lot of money in academics. And I'm not saying that money's the only driver, but it definitely drives some important parts of your life. So I was looking for a uh, change. I was looking at software and stuff. And with my background in discrete mathematics, um, certain kinds of programming really already spoke to me. So like relational databases was already something I was interested in. So I started uh, my job that I have now in summer of 2013, which is at Epic, it's in Madison. Is anyone not familiar what Epic is? Everybody is familiar with Epic, yeah, so why do you love it or hate it? You work with it in one way or another. Um, so <laughs> I work on the uh, data warehouse application. Uh, my job is essentially to write code that can move a lot of data uh, fast and efficiently. And you, if you work with Epic software, you may disagree with me, but um, <clears throat> so we write code that has to write, run basically in a lot of generic kind of SQL servers. Um, and my, yeah, so my job is developing code for a complicated data warehouse ETL and also concurrency, which is why I'm here to talk to you about locking. I have zero years experience as Microsoft MVP and zero years experience as Microsoft Certified Master. And I bring that up not to make you think like, why am I in this room? Mostly because what I'm up here doing right now is definitely something you guys can do too. Um, I know some of you already do. You've been at this game longer than I have for sure, but it doesn't take a whole lot for you to be able to offer something that other people can take advantage of too. So a lot of times I go to these talks and I see people say like, oh, I've been a Microsoft MVP for the last 37 years. You know, I started working on SQL Server before it was SQL Server and it's just kind of intimidating, but it doesn't really need to be that way. If you want to find me on Twitter, there's that. There's my email. And I also have a blog that I started about four or five months ago to write some of the interesting things that I end up dealing with every day. To me, it's more like I write it for myself so I can remember how I solved a problem. But it's also like I want to write something. If I spent time searching for it on the internet and I couldn't find the solution, that's definitely something I want to write down and share with other people. If there's something that was sort of close to what I was working on, but not exactly, I definitely want to share that too. So I try to write new stuff, um, which can be pretty tough, but um, that's just getting started. So if you want to get more information, especially about the stuff that I'm talking about here, you can take a look at that. So here's the agenda for today. We're going to talk about locking, isolation levels, maybe these things you've heard about before that you already have some experience with. But the first thing I want to bring up is, so why should I even care about any of this at all? So to me, it's more like when everything's going well, it doesn't matter at all. When it goes wrong and you have to solve a problem, then it matters that you understand this. And one of the things that I think people need to understand about it is like, if you're the kind of person who has to present that report to some CXO, you want to be able to tell them why it might not be on time. Or if developers are doing something funny with locking, 
And you have to explain to them why it might not be accurate or how accurate might it be. If it's going to, you know, be so accurate that the chances of it being wrong are like the chances that there is sentient life on the moon, you know, you don't need to worry about it. But to me, I want to understand why my reports might be slow. Could be because of some blocking. I want to be able to explain to people why that's happening. I want to be able to communicate with developers too and tell them why some shortcuts they might be taking might not be so good and that there are other ways to solve the problems you might have. And, you know, as time goes by, we want more and more people to have more and more self-service access to databases, which means concurrency, which if you're not on like a read-only secondary kind of thing, you're going to run into some problems like this. So to me, I want to understand it because I need to explain it to other people or explain why it might be hard to solve the problem or that's what I'm here for. Um, or you might be like me also and a couple of years ago someone said like, oh, here are a bunch of bugs. You need to fix them. And I was like, okay, thanks. So a primer on this would have been really helpful. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do here today. So I think a lot of people have an idea about what locking is in SQL Server and how it works and I want to just start basically from ground zero so we're all using the right language too and when you're talking to other people you're using the right language and so you can correct people when they use the wrong language because um, i think that's important as well so locking basics locking is just a way to isolate transactions from one another in the database it's a way to tell another transaction that some resource is in use um, it doesn't really do anything unless the lock is being respected Sort of like the lock in your house is only as good as people who respect it, right? So the things that you might lock in the database, what kinds of resources, what I'm going to talk about today mostly are objects like tables, pages where the data is stored. I'm not going to go deep into the SQL Server storage engine, but understanding how that works is helpful a little bit. So, you know, feel free to ask me questions if I'm skipping over something. Um, and then rows in those tables too. Um, and there are many other things we can lock. And, you know, basically, if you can think of anything in the database that you might have, you might want someone else to know that you're doing something with it at that time, there's some kind of lock you can take on that. So lock modes is a way to indicate how that resource is being used. Am I using it in a way that you can use it in the same way that I'm using it right now? Or should I be using it in a way that you can't use it in any way at all? Right? So. Typically, you think about shared or exclusive lock when you're thinking about this. The lock mode you'll see in SQL Server and in some of these demos coming up is S uh, for shared and X for exclusive. I'm also realizing now with this fancy screen, my laser pointer doesn't work on it, so <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <clears throat> so I'll be doing a little bit of this weather reporter style thing. Um, there's also schema stability lock and schema modification lock. To me, I consider these the four locks that if I understand that, everything starts to come a little bit more naturally. And the way I think about these kinds of, these four locks, I group them into two kinds of categories. I think about shared and exclusive about accessing the data. Sorry, I'm not trying to get in your way. I think about shared and exclusive about accessing the data. And I think about these schema stability and schema modification locks about accessing the objects that have that data. Like, am I changing something about the schema of the object, or can I not have the schema change right now because I'm doing something to that object, where this is about the data within? So another lock mode that people see, they see this I, you never see it on its own, but you see it as a modifier to some other lock mode. So this appears in front of another lock mode, like S or X. The I stands for intent, and what it means is it is the kind of lock that I will take if I intend to get another lock. So it is indeed a lock mode of its own that has you know, certain kinds of compatibility, but it's the way to tell somebody else, like, look, I have a lock on this object right now, but it's the kind of lock where I'm also going to need another lock to do something. So that's what the I stands for, intent. I intend to get a lock somewhere else. So an intent shared lock means I, try, I am intending to get a lock on a resource lower in the hierarchy, that hierarchy I showed on the first slide, object page row. Um, similarly, intent exclusive. I intend to get an exclusive lock on a resource lower in the hierarchy. So these are lock modes. 
bona fide on their own lock modes, but they're lock modes that say, I'm going to also get a lock somewhere else. Question so far? Feel free to just stop me if necessary also. I kind of, I tend to speak pretty fast if I'm not pausing. Um, so this lock hierarchy thing, this is not what people sometimes call lock escalation. That's something else. So that's also something to watch out for. I've heard people refer to this as lock escalation when they're, you know, when you're talking amongst friends and you aren't being 100% precise all the time, I see people do this kind of thing. So lock escalation is something entirely different. I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, you could probably do an entire session just on lock escalation. To me, this is more like lock granularity. It means like I want to get a lock somewhere else by doing something like this. If I need to read a row from a table, I just want to lock that row, but that row belongs to some page which belongs to some object. So in order to get the locks that I need to read that row, I need this intent shared lock on the object first to tell everybody I intend to get another lock on something that belongs to this object. I'm going to then take an intent shared lock on the page that the row that I want to read from lives on. And then I'll take a shared lock on the key if it's part of a clustered index. You'll see that say row or rid for row ID if it's a heap. So this is the order in which these locks are achieved. If I want to read a single row from a table under default isolation level in SQL Server with no locking hints, this is what's going to happen. And take an intent shared lock on the object, an intent shared lock on the page, and a shared lock on the key. And that's a little bit of a simplification about how SQL Server is actually reading that data. But this is essentially what happens and what you need to understand if you're thinking about what kind of blocks is this query going to take. So here's compatibility matrix, right? That's just a fancy word for a grid that tells you what locks are compatible with other locks. If you think about it, if I, so shared lock, if I'm reading some row, should you be allowed to read it too? Why not, right? We can read, well, we can read the same book, no problem, right? But if I'm writing to that row, should you be able to read from it? Well, under the default isolation level, and any isolation level really, but the answer is no, right? Because I might be changing that data. It's not safe for you to read it at this time, right? But this is why we have these intent shared locks and intent exclusive locks because if you're writing to some row in a table and I'm reading some completely different row, we should be able to do these things at the same time, depending on what the query is. But if it's just isolated like that, you're writing some row over there, I'm reading some other row over here, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do those things at the same time. So it would be kind of a nightmare for concurrency if we just locked the table and said, well, this guy is writing to it, so I take an exclusive lock on it. Right? It's like, well, I wanted to read some completely different row. So this granularity is a way for us to be able to do multiple things at the same time. And schema stability lock, you see, is compatible with everything except for schema modification. And schema modification lock is compatible with nothing. Um, that's so, I mean, if I am changing the schema of a table, and that doesn't necessarily just mean adding a column or dropping a column or changing a data type, it could also mean rebuilding the index, right? <clears throat> it's not possible for you to read that data at that time, right? And I say rebuilding an index, and I'm sure you've heard of online index rebuild, but how does that work? Basically, it creates a copy of the table, leaving the old one intact. And then when it's finished rebuilding the index over here, it does need a schema modification lock to say like, hey, this is the new index now, but it does it really quick, so it doesn't block it. So this is, this is just what I built myself, and this is not every lock mode. To me, if I, I can commit something like this to memory, or I can understand how these lock modes interact with each other without too much work. Um, so like on Books Online, this is what the matrix is because these are all the different lock modes. That's impossible. Like nobody is remembering this. And also, you know, some of these you're never going to remember anyways. You might not even encounter any of them. Another great thing about this lock matrix is N, which I thought meant, might mean like no, not compatible, actually means no conflict. So 
I guess that means they are compatible. C means conflict when C might mean compatible. So this is kind of a problem is what I'm trying to say. Uh, I means illegal, so I don't know if that means like a SQL Server just shuts down if you try <laughs> to. I was actually just going to ask, what's the difference between illegal and conflict? I don't know. Can you, can you know? still do it? You're not supposed to. Uh, so like the other great thing is most of the time you don't have control over what locks are going to be taken. What you can control is what I'm going to talk about in a second is isolation levels. And then SQL Server says like, oh, because of this isolation level, I will not take these kinds of locks as I do the thing that I'm going to do, right? You can specify some lock hints, and we'll see that in a couple of demos, to make it do different things, but it's not like I can sit there and be like, actually, you know, take this exclusive range update lock at the same time someone else is holding a schema modification lock and watch my SQL Server blow up. So the point is, this is useless. I spend a lot of my time uh, solving concurrency issues and reading deadlock XML and rewriting queries and adding indexes and doing things to mitigate those problems. And I never look at this. Yo. Um, this kind of going into things. Did you put that together? Or is this, this guy? Yeah. This is, on, this is on books online on MSDN. Okay. So yeah. that's what's on MSDN. I'm saying, like, this is a nightmare. Like this isn't this much more beautiful, and like it's big, right. and I can read it. <laughs> this is small, and I can't. The, the different different things, and like, why does N mean no conflict? That makes no yeah, sense. like nobody nobody QA'd this. No, no one think. No one looked at usability. So the point being is like again, what I'm trying to do here is make this accessible for all, and. When I first started solving these kinds of problems, and my only resource was books online and blogs of people, you know, of course I'm going to start with Microsoft documentation. Where else would I go first? And I see things like this, I'm just like, oh my god, like I don't know, I, like I don't know how to use this. And like, what is six? Is one of these lock modes? Like, where's five, for example? <laughs> like, what, what does any of this mean? Right. So it's very it's it's not something you should be concerning yourself with. I'm saying like if you want to understand how locking works, you start here, and then this thing sort of starts to come back. And we'll see how in some demos. So to talk briefly about this lock queue, so now that we understand maybe a little bit how locks are compatible with one another, um, how do we satisfy these requests? Well, essentially lock requests are just first in, first out. Um, so what that means is you can be blocked by some request that is waiting. If you have a shared lock on a table, and I want an exclusive lock on that table, I, of course, have to wait. But then if Caitlin comes in and is like, let me read that data too, well, let me take a shared lock, she is not blocked by me, my request. And you say, well, that's kind of weird. Like, shouldn't she be able to leapfrog you? Because, like, the, those shared locks are compatible. Well, that's not the way it works. So it's not, I, I say it's not sophisticated. That doesn't mean it's dumb. That means that it's just simple. And you could argue that it should work a different way, and there are ways to make certain things be able to do this leapfrogging thing. Um, but the default behavior is that it will not do that. So let's talk about these isolation levels. I brought it up just a second ago. Um, isolation levels control your susceptibility to these things called read phenomenon, right? Which is just fancy word for like some ANSI standard, blah, blah, blah. So you've probably heard about these three things in your life. I'm just going to go over them and we can see some examples of what they really are. Isolation level controls your susceptibility to these things um, by basically taking different kinds of locks and holding them for a different duration in the different isolation levels. Um, dirty read. I think we've all had some experience with this in our life, just reading data that's not committed to the database. There's nothing to answer there. A non-repeatable read. So that's where if I, re if I run one query in the course of my transaction and then run it later in the course of that same transaction, is the data that I get in both times going to be exactly the same? Right? It's depends on is that the behavior that you want, right? Must it be the case that all of my reads are repeatable? 
right? That's a decision you have to make. That's part of the ANSI standard. It's like, well, do you want that to be part of the default behavior of your database, or do you want that to not be part of the default behavior? It depends on what you're trying to do. And then there's my favorite thing, which is a phantom read, which is a lot like a non-repeatable read, right? So like, I used to think non-repeatable read, it's like, oh, that does exactly what it says on the tin. The read is not repeatable. Well, this is like a non-repeatable read of a different flavor, right? This is the, the number of results is different, right? So the result set, not, this is like, if I got the same result set, is all of that data in that result set, every column, the same? then my read was repeatable. This is the result set, the number of results in the result set is different. I have good examples about how these differ from each other so we can see them in practice. Uh, and isolation levels just control how you are susceptible to these things. So there are four isolation levels that are available to you in SQL Server. There are more if you have snapshot turned on. I can't talk about snapshots. Uh, as well as talk about all this other great stuff at the same time. So this is pre-snapshot, pre-optimistic concurrency kind of stuff. Um, but everything that I'm saying here is true on SQL Server 2017, 2016, 2014, 2012. Uh, anyone running older versions than 2012 in production in here? 2008, R2 still? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 2005. We got Oh my god, 2000? Yeah. Uh, you, you have you have too many clients. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so so anyways, uh, everything I'm saying is still true about old. Like I I mean I will just say back to 2012 for sure. I do not think it has changed between 2008. R2 and 2012. As far as isolation level behavior is concerned, and all of my demos probably still work there, but in the, in the interest of saying <laughs> true things, my experience only goes as far back as SQL Server uh, 2012 for this stuff. So, um, so yeah, you see here, read committed is the default isolation level in SQL Server. And you probably thought before walking in here today, like, ah, I don't need to worry too much about locking. SQL Server just like handles it. I know like people do crazy stuff sometimes, but whatever, I don't need to know. Well, under the default isolation level, you are susceptible to non-repeatable reads and phantom reads. So you might've thought like, wait, what? Like I can get like the wrong data under the default SQL Server isolation level? The answer is yeah, you can. So. You know, what are you going, but what are you going to do with that information, right? And you need to understand how your workloads are affected by these isolation levels. Hopefully these demos about to get to you will help us understand that. Um, so yeah, these are what are available to you. You cannot change the default isolation level in SQL Server, recommitted snapshot isolation, whatever, but uh, every connection is coming in recommitted. Let's get talking about some demos, because I think seeing this stuff in action is the best way to understand how it works. <clears throat> so if I can switch without. Breaking. OK. Someone please like yell at me if uh, some of the screen goes blank. Do me a solid there. Okay, so, so in the interest of transparency, here's the version of SQL Server that I, I have installed on my laptop right here, uh, 2017 CU10, which is pretty new. But again, nothing is really different here from earlier versions of SQL Server. So. You know, one thing I definitely get accused of is my demos are a little academic. I mean, that's my background. I like to sort of, you know, really boil things down to like, what is the easiest thing that sort of proves the point I'm trying to prove? Um, so 
these demos, while they might not reflect exactly some workflow you might do, I think they're pretty easy to find ways to map them onto workflows that you do. So uh, bear with me a little bit there, and we can talk about you know the validity of some of these things, but um, this at least shows us some of the behavior. So all I'm doing here is I'm going to create a table called employees. It's got some you know typical columns, some ID, primary key on that guy, employee name, start date, and end date. I don't store a lot of information about my employees because that's just the way my company works. I only hire people named John, apparently. Anybody in here named John? All right, then don't send me an application. So Smith, Doe, Cusack, Bon Jovi, Bonham, Wick, and Wayne. Some of my favorite Johns. <laughs> so <laughs> I did say that out loud. Is this being recorded? Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, geez, what have I gotten myself into? So I'm going to just read a single row from the database here, from this table, uh, just to prove something I said earlier about like what kind of blocks we would see. Um, I'm switching over to a uh, repeatable read isolation level just so that the locks that I want um, to see are held so I don't have to try to jump between windows and you know make something happen in a fast way. Um, so I'm going to just begin transactions, select a single row from this table, uh, select the John Wick row. Over here, I've got a query. You know, don't worry about trying to write this down or anything. Just, you know, the money thing here is this DMV, uh, sys DM trend locks. Uh, that doesn't store any historical information or anything in it. It just stores what is happening right now. So if you're in a position where, you know, maybe you had some blocking or deadlock problem, this is not the thing that's going to help you. This is the thing that might help you when there's activity on your database right now. So I'm just running this here. I've got some filters just to you know, clear up the clutter a little bit. If I run this correctly, we can see, yep, here are the locks I am getting. Over here you see session 55, right? If I zoom in on that guy right here. So that's 55, request session ID is 55. I have object, page, and key, and like I said, intent shared lock object on the employees table, intent shared lock on the page, and a shared lock on the key. So this is a clustered index, so that's why I expect to see key there. Let's roll that back. What happens if I read all the rows? So again, I get Intent shared lock on the object, intent shared lock on the page, and then I have a shared lock, one for each of my employees, so I got seven of those, right? Now this table is small enough that all the data fits on a single page. So as far as the SQL Server storage engine is concerned, you know, maybe you don't know a lot about it, maybe you know everything. Uh, all you need to know is like pages are where is the unit of storage, and those pages are size 8K. And this table is pretty small. so. Yeah, was I able to fit seven rows on a single page? I was. So that's why I only have one page lock showing up. Right? So that'll be important for a different demo later. But. So if I compare that with the read committed isolation level, I said something like I'm only doing this so that I can see these locks. If I open the transaction um, and then read these rows, if I come over here, I don't see any information. That's because those locks that I took to read those rows are already released. In the read committed isolation level, the locks are released, the shared locks anyways, are released as soon as the read is complete. So as soon as I'm done reading that row, I can give up that lock. And just for the sake of what happens if I use a serializable isolation level, out here, right? So I've got intent shared lock on the object again, intent shared lock on the page again, which I expect to see. And then I should have my seven locks. Wait a second. I have eight key locks. What is this? And they're not S locks anymore. They're this range SS, which we didn't talk about later. So what is different here between um, 
default isolation level or repeatable read isolation level and the serializable isolation level is that the serializable isolation level is trying to prevent anybody from inserting any data while I am already reading from that table at all. And the mechanism by which it is doing that is not by taking a shared lock on the table and thus blocking other people that way. It takes this, it takes this uh, serializable shared lock here on a key, you see this hex value FFFFF. -F 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 -F. That's not actually a row in the table. That's some resource that gets checked when an insert into the table is being done. If that resource is not locked, then it feels like the insert can go through. The way that serializable works is to lock that resource for as long as my transaction is open. So that's how we prevent um, phantom reads in the serializable isolation level, right? Because one way that this could be a problem is, and I'll see this in a second, but if I try to read from that table, if I'm not taking a lock on this row and holding it, someone else could insert another row, even when my transaction is open. Because if you recall, Intent exclusive lock is compatible with intent shared lock, so they'll be able to insert a new row unless I'm blocking them somehow. Serializable has to prevent um, phantom reads from happening, so <clears throat> that's the mechanism by which that happens. Take a lock on this row that's not a actual row in the table. So here I'm just rebuilding an index. Again, I'm doing this in a transaction people don't typically rebuild indexes within transactions. This is again, just to um, make it possible for us to see what kind of locks get taken. So I'm moving back to uh, recommitted default isolation level. I'm gonna rebuild the index there. Um, of course that was super fast because the table lives on one page. <laughs> like why are you even rebuilding that index? So, but if I look at how many locks that takes, wow, right? I look down here, what is that? 35 rows, so I needed 35 locks to make this happen. Right, I see a lot of intent exclusive locks on these, these things, you're like, wow, there's nothing in that query that references that, what's going on? Um, I see this, which for a long time, in my head I was pronouncing OBT until a Microsoft engineer told me that they pronounce it Hobbit, so, Great, that stands for heap or B tree, um, which if you ignore column store, the two standard storage structures for tables. I see some schema modification locks on these objects, the employees object, the employee PK, uh, index, resource type metadata, some page, dent. Again, if you know about the storage engine, you know what that is. But there's just, my point being like, look at all this stuff that has to happen when I rebuild an index on a single page table, right? So when you're thinking about your own workflows, I'm trying to rebuild an index. Um, what is actually happening here and who might I be interfering with, right? Go ahead and commit that transaction because I rebuilt that index and want to lose all that good work. <clears throat> okay. So let's move on to another example of that um, playing with isolation levels a little bit more. <clears throat> so I brought this up a little bit earlier, but I think we can see it in action now. So my company here, you know, I hire only these people named John. In particular, I hired John Wick. Um, if you don't know who John Wick is, that's fine. This won't be lost on you. If you do know who John Wick is, maybe this will be slightly funny. Uh, if I tried to fire John Wick, <laughs> that could be a bad idea. But I've been thinking about it because I hired him and, you know, I feel like he lied on his resume or something. I didn't get all the details. So I decided I might want to fire him. So when I showed up to work, I'm the manager, right? I open a transaction, I'm gonna set his end date to today. John Wick logs into the employee database, and John Wick being John Wick, of course, 
read uncommitted. He doesn't care about your read phenomenon. He wants data. He doesn't want to take locks and wait for stuff. He's like, ah, let me just see all that sweet data about myself. He comes in here. He sees this end data set to today. Uh, he's going to come to my office and wonder what's going on. And I'm going to be startled because to me, I, I was like, I didn't commit this transaction. How is he reading this? Right? So there's your dirty read. Right? That's, the, I think, the easiest thing to understand. I wrote some data to the database. I did not yet commit it. But if John Wick changes his isolation level to read uncommitted or uses this no lock hint, um, then it, no shared locks are taken at all. So the fact that I am holding some exclusive locks, and we can see over here, we run this monitor again, right? So session 57, that's me. Intent exclusive on the object, intent exclusive on the page, and exclusive lock on the John Wick row because I'm editing it right now, yet John Wick over here is able to read it. I explained to John Wick he shouldn't be querying my database with read uncommitted because he's going to see things like, you know, I was, you know, I may, maybe I convinced him I did it by mistake, and I never clicked OK, right? So the transaction was open. It's a poorly <laughs> designed application. So the transaction remains open <laughs> while I'm waiting to commit my data. So I tell John Wick, you know, why don't you just use the default level, uh, default isolation level in SQL Server? And he says, fine. Right? And he sees now, this time he's being blocked. Okay. So he understands, like, ah, yes. Undo this firing of John Wick here. Great. <laughs> he understands that he's blocked. That's fine. Now, let's say we sort of reverse the roles. If John Wick got to work before me, he opens a transaction and reads some data. He's like, great. I see. I still work here. He didn't fire me. He'll never find out about me. Uh, I don't like the way he barged into my office the other day. So I do want to fire him for real this time. I do this. I commit the transaction. You see, I am not blocked, even though John Wick is sitting there with an open transaction. And so when John Wick runs his query again, he sees that this end date now comes up. And he's wondering to himself, what is going on? I opened my transaction. My read was not repeatable. The data changed out from under me. You said that the default isolation level is what I should be using. I have to explain to him again, like, oh, yeah, that's right, except you have this problem with non-repeatable reads. And John Wick says, oh, man, this is just, you know, I don't know what you're trying to do to me over here, but this is crazy. But I understand that, you know, you're trying to run a company here, and I, I just like that he came and talked to me face-to-face, -face, so I hire him again. <laughs> I am not learning my lesson. Right? So uh, let's see, did I... Did I do this right? Let's just double check we don't have any open thing. Good. One other great thing about doing a lot of uh, lock demos in a public setting is you have a lot of open transactions. You can make some mistakes pretty easily. So anyways, if John Wick wants repeatable reads, right, because I explain to him how the default isolation level in SQL Server works, and I say your read wasn't repeatable, and he says, well, that sounds bad. I want repeatable reads. And I say, well, you can use that isolation level if you like. He says, great. So he does that. He reads this. If I try to fire him this time, now I will spin, right? And the reason why this is happening is because John, Le John Wick is holding the lock um, as long as his transaction is open on that John Wick row, okay? And what you see here, this behavior in SQL Server is, you know, not to worry too much about it, you see this U-lock was granted. You know, we didn't talk about U, right? So U stands for update, but it's a way where SQL Server can take these sort of like shared kind of locks with the intent of turning them into exclusive locks eventually so that readers won't block me while I'm scanning a large clustered index, for example. Um, so when you see something like this in SQL Server convert under request status. So you'll see things grant, convert, wait. Convert is just means wait, essentially. I have a lock that is granted to me. 
and I need it to be something else. So, but I, I'm currently being blocked here. So I cannot actually achieve this exclusive block right now. So convert is just a fancy way of saying wait because I have a different lock that I wish was something else. But that's what's happening right here. My session is session 57. I'm spinning, as you can see, still executing this query. And as long as John Wick leaves that transaction open, his reads are indeed repeatable, right? He gets the same result over and over and over again. Until maybe he rolls back or commits his transaction. As soon as that happens, you see this one fit. Oh, okay. So let's, John Wick now believes, hey man, I understand isolation levels, uh, repeatable read, that's the life for me, I think. So again, he's going to just stick with this. It's like, I love seeing all these employees, no problem. I open my transaction, see nothing has changed. I discussed this with the manager before. He told me that the data can't change under repeatable read. So I'm fine with this. But during this time, I'm like, you know what? This whole seven employees thing was great, but John Leguizamo, one of my favorite actors, applied. And I was like, your name is John, and I like your work. So I hired him. John Wick's like, ah, I love just seeing these seven employees. What is going on? Now I have eight. I thought you said my reads were repeatable. And I said, yeah, except repeatable read doesn't mean that like the read will repeat. Like, uh, it's just unfortunately like a limitation of the language. That is an example of a phantom read. You had the transaction open, but the number of results in your result set changed in between running that query. Now this is a, again, you know, academic example of a phantom read, but we'll see one in a second. And the lesson to take away is just that repeatable read doesn't mean you always get the same data, even with the same query and the same transaction. It means that the result set that you had, that data in that result set cannot change. It doesn't say anything about adding rows to the result set or that the result set will differ. That's a phantom read. Okay. So John Wick is, again, you know, sad. He says, let's give serializable a try. So let's just go back in time a little bit. Just recreate this. John Wick, you know, as a good employee does, reads books online. Sees like, oh, there's this thing serializable he never told me about. That seems to stop this weird phantom read problem. So I'll start using that instead, right? So if John Wick leaves his transaction open, now I, I can't, I can't hire John Leguizamo, and he's sitting right across from me, and I'm like, I just can't do it. The, the system's <laughs> locked up, and he gets up and leaves. And what you see is because there's competition, right? Contention on this FFFFF row that doesn't actually represent a row in the table but it's that resource that gets checked if I can do that insert. Now, my session over here is just in default isolation level. I try to take this range I and lock, whatever that means is whatever that means, but that's the lock that I try to get on that FFFF row when I'm trying to insert a row. If I can get that lock, then I know the insert is safe. If I can't, I know the insert is not safe. It's someone else is running a query under serializable. And under serializable, you can't allow for phantom reads, so I have to stop that. John Wick feels good, he's like, now I can run this query all day long. You can sit over here and spin, right? I don't care about you, it's like, fine. You do you, man. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. So I'm just going to show you another example of phantom reads. Um, 
help drive the point home maybe a little bit. I'm going to create a new table here called Employee Extended Info. This table, you know, I realize that my initial employees table is simply insufficient to store the data about my employees I need to store. Uh, so I create Employee Extended Info instead of adding columns to the original table because I need to keep that guy tiny. So I need to store information and like any you know, good database designer, I'll store that in an NVARCAR 4000 column because why not? <laughs> so I'm sure no one's had any experience with something like this before. So I'm gonna put a bunch of garbage in here. All this is is like I'm putting one row and like maybe also I'm doing some kind of like encryption or data scrambling like that's not real, but I'm just gonna put a bunch of Z's in there. And again, this is just so that the table takes up more than one page, right? So I'm just putting a bunch of information down there um, to prove to you what I'm talking about. Um, there are a couple of ways I can do that. I can look at statistics IO. Uh, also, if you're like, what does that table really look like? It's just one row per employee with a bunch of Zs. That's the information I store about my employees. I see logical reads nine, right? So that is actually seven pages worth of data. If I look at employee extended info with SP space used, um, I get that information here. So we talked earlier about if I need to understand anything about the storage engine, it's simply that the unit of uh, storage is the page and the page is 8K. Um, and I have seven rows worth of data and I have seven pages, seven times eight. So, so, so this is all just me like proving to you I'm not lying. That's all that that is. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, so again, I'm just sure I don't have any open transactions. Okay, so now here's what I'm gonna do. In the background, I'm just gonna kick this off, and maybe you've seen a demo like this before, but I think it's really illuminating. Um, all I'm doing here is I'm just switching the row that is ID1 to the row now ID8, and I'm gonna switch it back from ID8 to ID1. You say, I have absolutely no workflow that mimics that. Sure. The, the point of this is to change something in the index that forces SQL Server to move that data, like from one page up here to, oh, it's in a different place in the index. <clears throat> I need to move that page or that data on a page somewhere else in the index. By taking the row that's at the top or the leftmost part you can consider, right, of the tree, I have to move it to the end. And then when I change it from ID8 to ID1, I've got to move it back to the beginning. So that's what this workflow is. And you can consider something like this, like maybe you're updating zip codes or something on your uh, customer base. If you have an index on the zip code column, which maybe you do, right, that requires SQL Server to move that data around in that index. So you could consider something like that. <clears throat> so this is a little misleading, but it's all good. I'm just going to select from that table. I'm going to do it in a loop. I'm going to do it with read uncommitted. I'm doing this in a loop so that I don't have to keep trying it over and over, and maybe it will just hit right away and we'll be lucky. So blah, 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 do that, stop it, did it work? Let's see. So how many employees do I have? Just seven, right? Okay, so this one I've got seven results. Seven results. Hey, how about this one? Oh, surely this is one that's like two through eight, right? Wait, what? There's only six rows there. But I have seven employees, right? I mean, like this thing, while it is switching from ID1 to ID8, at no point are there fewer than seven rows in that table. And yet, I just ran a query where I only got six results. Okay. Right, so that's an example, again, of a phantom read. The result set is not is in some sense missing a row, right? 
So you say like, okay, well, you did that with read uncommitted, man. Like, I'm not too worried about you. And you claim that that's an example of a phantom read. Fine. Right? Well, then I'll just use repeatable read. Let's see what happens. Whoa, what? Oh, shoot. Okay. So repeatable read ended up me getting a deadlock, but not before I got the wrong result set twice. And then it looks like the correct result set once, the wrong result set, and then it deadlocked. Oh man. And that's under repeatable read. That's more restrictive than read committed. So you're like, what? Man, I hope I'm not gonna be taking serializable all over the place. That's gonna just lead to more deadlocks, right? So here's your, you know, I need to understand how am I going to explain this to somebody? Like I could get the wrong data, you know, the setup the way this is. If I have, so I've got this like crazy OLTP thing going on here where I'm moving pages in this index all over the place, right, repeatedly. And I'm trying to run some like summary query on that same data while that's happening. Those two things aren't really compatible with one another, right? So that's why people do things like I have read-only secondary or I move stuff into my data warehouse and I don't let people query stuff during ETL, right? Because I need to make sure that all of the data is uh, you know, consistent and all my lookups are good. And then I let people run their analytical queries. If they want to run analytical queries somewhere else, I have my read-only secondary that I switch over to in my application during before ETL starts. And then when ETL is done, it flips to the new one, right? That's how I have my thing set up maybe. Because these two things don't mesh well with each other, okay? Even when I use this restrictive isolation level, I get undesirable results, okay? So, you know, it's give and take. What am I, what am I supposed to, what am I trying to do with this database? You know, Microsoft SQL Server can solve all of your problems, right? But maybe not with one instance of it in one place all the time, right? So you just have to think about what, um, what it is you're trying to do and how this might affect, how this kind of behavior might affect your uh, workloads. Again, about Nine more minutes. Uh, I do have more slides. So I'll just go back to this briefly. Um, maybe I'll have a chance to be able to do this demo. Um, so, you know, this next section is just living with locking. So I just showed you this example that might make you sad or make you think like, wait a second. <laughs> Does something like that happen in my system? Am I susceptible to this kind of thing? Um, so people like to use locking hints to solve some of these problems sometimes. Um, uh, no lock is a way to style, solve some blocking problems. That's table level read uncommitted. <clears throat> so that means take no shared locks. No lock doesn't mean take no locks, which is unfortunate. You still have to take schema stability locks on the object. And then there's tab lock and tab lock X. Um, those are to take table level locks and avoid these granular locks. That might be something you wanna do if you have to maybe select all the rows from a pretty large table. You want to subvert this lock escalation, which I didn't really get a chance to delve into, but you wanna just don't even bother taking these granular locks because there is overhead for doing that. There's overhead for like allowing for this concurrency, but I don't need that to happen. You also need tab lock and tab lock X if you want parallel insert and minimal logging. And that's what this example is gonna be about. So I you know 10 to, let's see. Good. Okay, so again, let me just make sure I got nothing going on here. So I'm just going to create a table here. Again, this is something you can think about. Maybe you have something like this in your system. Uh, you know, you have people doing stuff in the client. Uh, 
and you try to log those actions, but you don't serialize to the database with every action the user takes. So it would just be, you know, too much activity. So you let this build up in the cache in the client, and then every so often you flush everything to this durable system log, right? So I'm just storing some ID, time recorded, and what message just tells me what they might have done. Um, I'm going to look at two execution plans. Uh, who spends a lot of their time looking at execution plans in your SQL Server life? You do? A few folks? Okay. So even if you don't, I think it'll be pretty easy for us to understand how these things are differ, different from each other and um, why it might matter how they're different from each other. So I'm just going to zoom in here real quick, if this allows me to do that. So here's the execution plan, whatever. I'm just inserting a bunch of rows into this table. What I want you to focus on is how is this end part different from each other, right? I got a table insert here, and I got a table insert here, and the ticket really are these parallel lines, right? So this is the query. It's, I, the query is identical to each other, except for this one has with tab lock, and this one doesn't. Right, so I didn't put a primary key on this table, it's just a heap. And I want to take advantage of parallel insert into this table. So when I'm flushing to that table, it goes as fast as possible. That's my plan. So I'm using this tab lock hint to make that happen. And here's evidence in the execution plan that that is going to happen. So that is why I might write code like that, is the point. And you're thinking like, well, the way, and the way my uh, application works is, I have different users doing stuff and, you know, the cache just builds up there. I'm not so concerned with this log being, you know, up to the second accurate. So if one guy tries to take a table lock to insert and the other guy is blocked by that table lock, that's fine. Like, as soon as that table lock is released, these, query, these queries will just line up and then they'll just come off the queue as they go through. And I'm not too worried about that kind of behavior. So this is how I design my application. <clears throat> okay. So what I want to do is, like, so what happens when multiple sessions try to do this thing, right? So I'm going to simulate some blocking over here. Just going to do a count from that table with uh, holding a shared lock on that table so that it will block these concurrent sessions. So here's this guy. He's going to try to uh, flush his data to disk. He's going to try to flush his data to disk, too. And they're just going to sit and spin, right? Why? Because they're both blocked by um, right? So 61 is this one that's spinning. 62 is the other one that's spinning. 60 is the one that's holding that share lock. And now I requested a table level lock, yet this says intent exclusive. So like I'm sitting here like, wait, that seems weird. Like what do you intend to get a lock on? Ah, well, I'm sure this is perfectly fine. <laughs> right? So as soon as I give up this shared lock, I expect those other two lock requests to just sort of serialize and everything should be okay. Right? The way I described it earlier is that it's just first in, first out queue. So that's how it should work. All right. So give up the lock there. These two guys are still executing. Probably takes a look. What the? Oh, man. Are you kidding me here with this? You're like, what? Why did they deadlock? Oh, uh, shoot. Right? So how do I do anything about this. You're like, man, I've been like, you know, I promised whoever this, you know, feature would be in place. I was so sure this was going to work, but I put it off until right now. So how am I going to find out what's going on? So luckily, SQL Server has, um, this is turned on by default now. Um, and I still see some people, they like to set up separate extended events or turn on some trace flag. Maybe you've heard of this trace flag 1204. I think that is actually not recommended by Microsoft to have on anymore in production because it can itself contribute to blocking. And that seems crazy. It's the thing that's supposed to capture deadlock information for you. So 
this thing is turned on by default. So if you run into such an issue, or you know, maybe it's on one of your clients and they're like, I have deadlocks, fix them. And you're like, e thanks. Um, crap, none of my monitoring tools I would use are on this database. I can't install things like SP Blitz Cache or SP, or sorry, SP Blitz Lock. Uh, you know, all these first responder kit tools that Ozar likes to give away for free. I don't work for Brent Ozar. Uh, full disclosure, I am friends with someone who is a friend of Eric Darling. So, like, I'm not saying go use SP Blitzlock. I'm saying don't use it because this thing's installed by people. But anyways, <laughs> it's a great tool. You should check it out. So this thing called the System Health Extended Event, that's the guy you want to look at if you are wondering, ah, what kind of behavior just happened. You can come in here, view target data. You see, I already have it filtered to deadlocks, but one of the things that you can do is you can right click on this name column, filter by this value. I'm looking for the thing called XML deadlock report. This thing is notoriously weird to deal with. Like the filter you see it appears twice, you're like, what is going on? Just let's not worry too much. Right? So the dead you saw I caused a deadlock earlier, right? At 658. I caused another one at 707. So there are two ways to get into this. You can look at the XML itself. You can look at this fancy picture. And there are definitely tools out there that are better for visualizing these things. There's a free one made by Century One, who I also don't work for, um, called Century One Plan Explorer. But in addition to allowing you to interact with execution plans, also allows you to interact with deadlock XML. And there, it's it's gotten a lot better. Um, again, I don't work for them, but I have no problem saying you might want to check that out. So when I unfortunately was starting to do this, uh, I didn't have a lot of tools available to me. I was forced to start looking at XML. And this looks like, man, I do not want to do anything with this. But we'll see here, this is the money information for our problem that we're dealing with right now. What I see is in these in this resource list, I see, okay, durable system log, someone was going for IX, durable system log, someone was going for IX. That's exactly what we saw happen, right? And then he wanted something called BU. You're like, oh, maybe that's why it was IX, intent exclusive. He was intending to get some other lock the lock he was going to get was this BU, whatever that is. So you go look it up, you find out that stands for bulk update. You find out that that's the kind of lock that SQL Server tries to take when you do parallel and insert into a heap. And you're like, yeah. You also find out that bulk update locks are compatible with each other. Two bulk update locks can be taken at the same time. You're like, man, that's fantastic. But not when you try to convert them from IX like this, because BU is not compatible with IX. But IX is compatible with IX. I have IX, you have IX, we feel good. You wish to go to bulk update, you can't because I have IX and I can't give it up. I wish to go to bulk update, I can't get it because you have IX and you can't give up yours, deadlock. You're like, wait, bulk update is supposed to allow concurrent insert and it just stopped us from doing concurrent insert. That is so bogus. And it's like, ah, well, if only you didn't have to go from IX to BU first. So this is the behavior uh, that caused our problem here. So I'm running out of time, so I just want to finish this up real quick. Depending on how this application is set up, a good solution here might be instead of trying to take tablock, to instead take tablock X and say, I want exclusive table lock because what I was expect I wasn't I wasn't like dying to get parallel insert across session. Right, like concurrent inserts. I just wanted parallel inserts. I was fine if they serialized themselves. Okay, that's what I was going for. Well, in that case, then your solution is to just take tablock X there, and this will work. Um, so you want me to set this up again, just real quick? Should be easy enough.
<sighs> so locking, I'm going to get rid of this. That looks like you stopped share. What? No, I don't see it anymore. You must have rejoined. I oh, know. Well, it'll. And this is. <laughs> They'll have to read my blog. <laughs> should I try joining again or should I just yeah, finish up this demo here? Or? Try rejoining real quick. All right, let's just see what this is. So edgy. All right. Am I a presenter? Am I a presenter? Okay, so let's let's set this up. So, uh, okay, let me just make sure again. Nothing's happening. Nothing is happening. Uh, so I'm just gonna, you know, set up this query to start the blocking. Got that table looking good. Tab lock. <clears throat> what happens if I try with tab lock X? Right. Also, just. Can I even get the firewall as it's happening? Oops. Right. So, you know, proof positive, I'm at least still getting parallel insert. Right. We could argue whether you think I'm getting minimal logging. I am, but. Now, when I come over here, ah, that's the behavior I want to see. These guys are waiting for exclusive lock. As soon as I quit uh, this transaction, those guys should serialize. They should both write their data. I should get okay. So if that was the behavior I was itching to get anyways, tab lock X was the key, not tab lock. Okay. So again, it's not like it's a solution to everything. It's like, oh, I was trying to tab lock and I didn't get the behavior I wanted time for tab lock X. But, but it's a way that's like, even when I specified the lock that I wanted, I didn't get the lock I think I was going to get. And it's just this kind of behavior that's like, man, I, sometimes this stuff can be pretty tricky. So I'm going to go uh, just to the end of my slides and wrap up here. Um, great resource here is... Uh, Kaylin Delaney, who, if if you're familiar with anything SQL Server-wise, she's like an internals master. Uh, she knows lots of stuff. She is the one who kind of saved my life in a sense when I needed help. Uh, she had the materials that I needed to get up to speed pretty quickly. Her book is free. Her book is awesome. Um, go check it out. And. That's it for me. There's my email and Twitter handle and blog. If you want to read more about some of the examples I did today, I blog about them there. You can reach out to me for any reason. Uh, thanks again. It was great. Uh, any other lingering question? Okay, great. I really appreciate it, guys. I'm glad to be the inaugural presenter at your Skyline-based meeting. Uh, I'll put that on my resume. <laughs> but I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. All right.